Hello, you're watching another episode of In the Line of Wire. I met two young people who are so funny. You'll see from the moment that they introduce themselves to the fact that they're doing some really crazy things. And what I was most excited about is that one of them, the CEO of a company called Tintash, actually worked at Apple computers for five years. Wow, I was really blown away. And the CTO, no, actually he's the CMO, Manan Amin, didn't want to do a serious interview, so he thought he was being funny. I'll leave you to judge whether he was or he wasn't. Tintash is a company based in Lahore, and they are in the space where they're developing applications for the iPhone. Let's go and see what they had to say. Hello everyone, I've actually snatched the camera from Jahan. Here is the agenda for today. Manan Murad, past to present. Tintash, how, what, the gaming industry, hiring for startups, and now over to John. Thank you. I'm glad to have my camera back. <laughs> okay, now, can you please introduce yourself so they know which one is the crazy one and which one? He's the sensible one and the crazy one. one. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Tell us a little. Sure. Um, so um, I'm the CEO of a mobile gaming company, Tintash, and. Um, um, is the CEO of the same company. Okay. Um, so my story, I guess, basically started when I uh, went to the U.S. for my uh, undergraduate study, and I decided to pursue computer science when I was there. And since then, I've been in the IT world. Um, I finished my undergrad and my masters, and worked in Silicon Valley for a bunch of years. So I worked at Apple. And, yeah. Wow. Uh, <laughs> This was during the transitional period. Basically, uh, Steve Jobs had returned. You know, the first iPod was out. Uh, the iMacs were out. The first versions were out. Uh, and the company was basically just coming back into its uh, sort of glory days again. And uh, so it was a lot of fun. It was very exciting. Which team so were you working? So, did you join when the glory days were coming back, or did you leave when the glory days? Uh, no, I I think I joined when the glory days were coming back. I left when they were taking off really well. <laughs> uh, so what was happening when you left? Um, hey, I'm supposed to be conducting okay, sorry, this interview. Sorry, sorry. Okay, but so I'm what sorry. was happening <laughs> so, when you left? Uh, oh, when I left, uh, the company was actually working on the iPhone. So oh, I guess I wow. did a little bit too prematurely. Right. Um, what I, did you actually work on at Apple? Sure. So I was um, part of their uh, program management team and we got to work on uh, some of the uh, new products that they were focused on. And one of those were a 64-bit uh, processor, which is called a G5, is their uh, main, uh, you know, flagship product that was going to target enterprises, high-end users, people who were in the animation industry or needed a lot of computational power. Um, and actually, you know, right when it came out, they um, uh, generated a supercomputer based on a cluster, uh, clustered set of those G5s, uh, which was supposed to be extremely inexpensive in comparison. So it was a very exciting product for them. Um, and you know, likewise, there were other products coming out. There was the first 17-inch laptop that came out then. Right. Uh, it, was, uh, it had a backlit keyboard. Uh, it had ambient sensors, so if it was too, uh, it was dark. The keyboard would light up, um, and they, uh, you know, made the whole uh, system. You know, the industrial design for it was very unique. It was very cool to look at. Uh, so, what was it like? I mean, all of us who adore Steve Jobs and love Apple. Uh, we're told that he's a very difficult man to work with. What was it like working at it's, Apple? It's difficult to really work. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think he's, um, you know, he's very uh, sure about what he wants, and uh, he's able. He's a very charismatic fellow, so he's able to get his the entire company behind him, um, and uh, you know, he has very high standards about what he wants to see in the product that one is building. And what that typically means is that he can be very mean, he can be very abrupt, um, but those are, you know, traits that can, you know, sort of, it depends on how you see the glass is half full or half, half empty. Because of that attitude, he also gets the best out of people. Exactly, sometimes. exactly. And, uh, it's all worth it in the end. In the end, yeah, it's definitely it. <laughs> and it teaches you that Jugaad is not acceptable. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Right. And because he has his following uh, amongst Apple fans or, you know, Mac. Uh, addicts as is the you know, common usage for that. Um, he's able to really sort of rally the troops around a new product. It okay. makes it very easy for Apple to bring something out into the market 
because they already have the early adopters right there for them. So no matter what Apple launches, they have that first couple of months. Yeah, but they can yeah. be very cruel too. They're, yeah. <laughs> they're, they don't accept just anything that Apple launches. That's true. I mean, look at That's the true. Newton. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Yeah. Um, it's just that you know they have an initial um, yeah. sort of burst of energy behind any product that they bring up. So it was fun. It was great. You know, I uh, uh, left Apple, decided to join the Evil Empire for a little bit of time. Oh no! <laughs> oh, how terrible! I'm not sure if I can mention that on tape or not. <laughs> right. <laughs> so uh, I was at Microsoft for a little while, um, and then you know I came back to Pakistan and uh, started working on Dintash. So that's okay. how the company got started. All right. And when was that? This was in uh, May, middle of 2007. Okay. And you, Manan. Manan. Uh, Your story. So story, far. <laughs> my story so far. It's basically LUMS. Uh, LUMS is Stanford and Stanford back home. Okay. Uh, we joined in touch. Okay. We met for breakfast actually at, uh, yeah. in the valley because yeah. Mujay, three, four people had separately asked me, okay, you must be in Iran. He talks just like you. Yes, a lot of people have told me that as well. <laughs> You know, when the fifth person came and said to me, you know, have you met Murad? And these guys didn't know each other, but someone knew Murad and me. So I was like, okay, and I think one of them connected us, and then we met for breakfast, and the interesting thing is, I'm not an early riser either, neither is Murad, but we both thought that the other one was, and we got up and had breakfast at 8 a.m. Wow. Very crazy time for us. Yeah, Hobi is a cafe or It was really nice. Okay. And did you sort of bring out a napkin and start drafting a plan or? No, we actually had no <laughs> idea. So all they told us was that there are two people who really want to go back to Pakistan and do something from there. Okay. Uh, so at that point there was actually no vision for Tim Tash, right. not in my mind at least. Yeah. Uh, and after that one meeting, I came back to Pakistan and trying to do something. And another guy comes to me and he's like, man, you have to meet Murad. I'm like. I <laughs> met him. <laughs> and then when we met at uh, uh, Coffee Tea and Company, no. Two regions once again. Okay. And then we decided to actually prototype working together. Tried it out for three months and you know, my and I knew the thing. It seemed like a great partnership. Okay. We thought of it, so we went for it. So what has it been like these two years? Um, well now we do fight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we now that you know each other better. Come with nice terms like creative conflict and building. <laughs> Right. All those things. But okay. it's been a lot of fun. I think you know what we're doing is exciting. It's fun stuff. It's of course high pressure as any startup should be. Yeah. Uh, and there's a lot of stress that comes with it. But I think we cope with it together. Sometimes you know, we sort of help bring. We go for breakfast. You know, turns out to be tea yeah. in the evening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, breakfast becomes lunch often because we have very nocturnal schedules. Uh, right. So we have some. You know, a lot of our. Part of our team, part of people we deal with are in the, on US time, so we end up spending a lot of like late nights working with them as well. Okay. Um, yeah, it's, I think it's fun overall. Um, we've you know been growing our team quite a lot in the last couple of months. Uh, How many people work with you now? Uh, what about? Yeah, it's, I've lost count. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I have actually just gone to get slashed and I didn't know what's <laughs> happening. So somewhere in between 20 12 20 and 20 24. <laughs> Okay, 20 to 25, okay. Yeah. And so what has Tintash done to date that you're excited about? Um, well, I think the most, the single most exciting thing we've had is we had a top 10 application on iTunes. Okay. Uh, this was Fishing Frenzy, which is a game we uh, made in partnership with Mindstorm Studios. And um, the, uh, you know, to be a top 10 application basically means we have... Amongst 50,000. Amongst 50,000 is, is a good, you know, sort of milestone to reach, you know, we certainly didn't plan for it, but we are very happy we got there. No, we're not complaining, we got there. <laughs> yeah, One small company sitting in Lahore, Pakistan, doing that, that was fun. <laughs> I think we enjoyed that. Exactly. It's actually interesting, so we were somewhere around number 66, and Murad asked me to check, we've gone down the chart, and I'm checking, and I couldn't find the bus, I said, damn. Now we've gone off the chart. I see 24, like, whoa, 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 <laughs> we're still there. <laughs> yeah, and so the, I mean, we went to the number seven. Yeah. That was fun. Yeah. That was fun. Okay. Um, you know, it certainly gave us the confidence to know that we could do products. You know, right. Because uh, there are very few product-oriented companies uh, that operate in, in the region. I would say not even just Pakistan, but in the region overall. Um, 
and uh, but a growing number in Pakistan now. Yeah. It's good to see actually. Mm, yeah, yeah. Uh, but very slowly growing. Yes, yeah. actually we have this process for we can't really know about a product here if it'll you know, be a hit or not. But we do have this process and there was certainly no big validation for that till now. I don't even know if one hit product is a validation, but yeah, I mean it's you know It's a beginning. We went about this very deliberately. I mean we chose the genre, we chose what we wanted to do, so we like a ton of decisions. Uh, but this was not your first product for the App Store, was it? Um, no, 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 it totally wasn't. Um, it was you know, yeah, yeah I, I, I would say, you know, we basically uh, did the first product when I was visiting the US and Milan was here and uh, one of our engineers wanted, was to study for the GRE, he wants to, you know, plan for graduate study um, and he needed an application that could allow him to improve his vocabulary. And so I think this was a sort of a, almost like a lab project in house. Milan helped him get started, basically by, by recommending that you, know, you should go ahead and build it because you can. You know, if you don't have an application, go ahead and engineer build it. <laughs> and so I think uh, very good, good motivation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The engineer probably didn't know what he was getting himself into. <laughs> okay. Went ahead and built it. Um, and uh, I think so. A lot of that, you know, just happens and it just it just happened on its own and. Uh, and we put it out there on the App Store without really knowing what response we get, had no idea. Um, and that did quite well. So that was our first clue that you know, we had figured out uh, something that would, could be great. Yeah. It was something like this. After the weekend, I expected it's 10, 20, maximum 100 okay, downloads. This was a free app. Uh, after the weekend, we come back and we're having lunch and we're other system. I was like, yeah, well, how did we do it? He's like, yeah, uh, 2,000 downloads. Wow. And I was like, did you check that right? <laughs> I didn't trust him. So we have to actually go and check this again. And like, yeah, he yeah, is. Same kind of. Same group from there. Um, and you know, we've had a fair mix of, of course, um, doubts and failures. And I think what you know may have helped us is that you know we've often tried to look back at the failures to figure out why. why well, that's the way. Yeah. yeah. Because if you don't learn from your failures, then. I mean, I think we understand that you can't manage uh, innovation, uh, but we need to create the sort of conditions that we start with that. So, yeah, I mean, these successes are actually accidents. Okay. Uh, so, if you were actually to ask a formula, okay, uh -huh. then you can see what you have due to liberation. So, the way it is as a failure, the way it is as a success is the way it is. I think there's a lot of passive knowledge that is actually accumulated over time right. based on the failures you have. And that is allowing us now to do uh, a lot better than we used to. I mean, we're certainly not where we uh, can be. I think we have a lot of room for growth, and you know, inshallah, we will get there uh, if we just keep at it. Um, there's a lot we can learn from people already in the field, and uh, that's one thing we are doing these days. We're trying to work with big publishers, big game developers, um, and you know that uh, sort of allows us to both make sure that what we are building is of high standard. And we also, there's a lot of sort of uh, learning that we can uh, incorporate within our own company, both in terms of processes as well as just having a, a much better lens through which we view the, the products. Where do you find your people from? Because this is not a typical software company or service company. So where do you get these uh, um, young people? Yeah, we actually go, you know, walking around <laughs> universities, and find out like that. <laughs> That's why you teach. I have a sneaking we, suspicion. Yeah. <laughs> we, we actually do. We go the entire uh, across the board. Uh, um, universities we visit, we have the proper resumes, we have the proper board, and we have the board. I think references are very good. We know someone, we have someone who knows someone, and they want to come in for an interview. And they're passionate, they're incredibly smart. They definitely will not know yeah. what it is that we're doing. You know, right. we are doing. Yeah, we came for And frankly, I mean, I'm learning a ton, ton of this every day. You know, right. I know a lot about this, but a ton of things are still very new to me. But as long as the passion is there, uh, you know, and the professionalism is there, then that can be done. So but it's not just engineers you need, is it? No, not at all. Um, you need people who have good design have, sense. You see, there is a process for getting the art skill, the graphic design. It certainly is a challenge to find uh, people who um, have creative, artistic skills, can understand what is required in order to build a game, 
Um, because you know, just having an art background is not enough. You also no. need to have a good sense for what good gameplay is, how games can be designed, um, and often there is this interact interactive sort of uh, play that goes on between an artist, game developer, or designer, and the engineer working on the prototype for whatever game you're trying to build. And so people need to be able to work in teams together, understand the other one's you know, requirements and needs. So it requires a certain mindset um, that uh, you know, can be somewhat more challenging for people who haven't worked in teams. That's one of the um, issues that often comes up. You know, students do have experience working on group projects and but you know the experience is typically not very uh, interactive. You know, and it's either engineers working together or designers working together, but not cross discipline. Exactly, it's not interdisciplinary. Uh, and also, you know, schools themselves have barriers in place. You know, and we have Definitely. to fight for this. Even in <laughs> institutions, we have a chance to make a difference. That often this, there's a mentality that you know this is only the students here should work only on this specific thing, um, and that we have to you know sort of break some of those kind of uh, sort of mental blocks initially um, and we try to pick people who are fresh out of college for that reason often you know and uh, they come in they have some good ideas themselves uh, and we learn a lot from them too and uh, you know as a team they can come in and they can work together and they learn a lot from each other so all we try to do is to create a good environment where the, there can be real growth and I think that's it really you know we don't have a a syllabus for them or anything like that. Right. They just come in and they learn it. Themselves. But it's a challenge in itself. Each person is, it's, it's actually, we have a very, uh, what's the right word, a thorough process for someone coming in because we need yeah. to make sure that we team built the right work for having a quality team because each person is like a key ingredient in something that you're cooking, right? Its value is quite significant. Yeah, I mean, they have to be a good fit, you know, for the team, they, you know, and so we do try to make sure that, you know, there's the, uh, the team members are involved in the interview process, um, and, you know, often when we get people through sort of word of mouth, uh, if there, there are people in our own uh, company who suggest friends or people they've worked with, and uh, so that helps us with that process a little bit. Um, but certainly, you know, one of the biggest challenges we have is we have fairly good engineering schools in Lahore. Um, we have some good art schools, um, but we certainly feel the need for uh, a much, you know, more coherent game design program or a game development program, animation. You know, there are certain specific areas where we feel there's a really big gap. Um, and on engineering, also, you know, there's a big gap in basically being able to think about products and how you build them or engineer them. So you on usability, you on CI, on just general design, um, you know, how do you think about a problem, break it down, and it's simple enough so that you can actually build something out of it. Because most of the time people have a problem getting started. Right. That's the issue we have. Yeah, Some so of you joins in, they have no idea. Don't get surprised if very soon you actually have an eminent school for games <laughs> and animations coming about. I hope so. I've been pushing for it for years. <laughs> Do you think that the government can do anything in this area? Um, I mean, no. <laughs> come on, education is the government's responsibility, right? Uh, but and if this is an... But the inherently in these other bureaucratic areas, the, the, the way they are set up, uh, they really will not be able to do something. You won't get people with PhDs in game development or anything. It will be people who a bunch of people who are in this industry have just right. picked it up themselves. Right. So if you have that requirement as a school for a PhD or the you don't even know that. You need people who know that stuff and even the stuff they know is actually changing over six months. Of course, of course. So you have to accept that. So there has to be people who know their stuff most importantly. And then people who are actually able to teach that stuff. Right. Because you might know it but you might not be able to teach it. Uh, they could actually do the stuff around the site. I mean, they could manage again all the sort of institution to come about. Uh, I'm sure there are some taxes or there are uh, policies or there are conferences to have a page. They may be very happy. No, those are important. Problems, right? I mean, yeah. um, look, uh, we can only think about so much. We can only train so fast. Uh, we can only face so many challenges. But we do actually give very serious thought to. Uh, at some point starting the school around gaming and animation because I think there's a huge scope for this. That's right, uh, it's a big market out there. It's, it's, it's bigger than uh, Hollywood, of course, just for the record. Right. Uh, iPhone, I bought an iPhone, but 
they hit a 1 billion apps downloaded mark faster than they did a 1 billion songs downloaded mark. So that says something. Right. Yeah. That's, that's my take on it. We might disagree. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's uh, trying to be nice to you. <laughs> uh, he's always nice to me. Yes, I do. <laughs> well, you know, for, for government, there's certainly uh, uh, the need for financing, funding a lot of these initiatives. Um, so government can play a role in that by establishing a finance, you know, similar to uh, how the R&D fund works for uh, ICT. You know, there could be certainly some funds for um, getting these type of programs started. Um, an endowment fund could help the university set up a program like this. Um, I think a lot of the real um, growth will come about from industry and university collaborations. Of course. And mm -hmm. So I think that's really where it has to start. Uh, there's a very small industry around it, so that is, I think, one of the major problems. There's a chicken versus the egg issue. Um, so I think we need to grow things um, probably a step at a time. Um, you know, a good step would be just recognizing that there's a big industry, there's a big opportunity here. Um, and uh, you know, so this is something we suggested to um, several, uh, you know, good established universities that, for starters, you know, the, one has to at least study the space. And we have to see what steps need to be taken. And so just support for that initiative, just to actually see if there is, uh, you know, how many people would need to be trained, or maybe what would be the process, at what level we should do this, and how would we supply the labor pool to local and foreign, uh, you know, um, uh, buyers, whoever they are. Um, that has to be figured out to some extent. Okay. So I think we, we, we are getting a good sense of a lot of that, so we can certainly help. I think industry can offer a lot of advice on this. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, we can probably get started, you know, after we've had a little more growth ourselves and, you know, take a little bit more concrete steps around that. Right. Now, it must be a challenge trying to attract people in to come and work for a startup. Not the kids themselves, possibly. <laughs> Yeah, I was just telling you how it's not a challenge to attract kids themselves because they will be excited about working in a game development. Up playing games, right? Um, so you know they're very interested. In fact, I have a friend who joined Lums with me. And, you know, he, his opinion about his thoughts about computer science was that okay, you're going to create a game. He was very excited about that. Till he learned that he has to be smart. He's not smart enough to do that. So then, you know, he gave it off for that. But they're very excited about it. So how do you put a game together? Right. How does this, we put this all alive, but how does it work? What's hard, and I think this is what the challenge is, is that, and I can understand this, it's, it's pretty fair, okay? We attract someone, the guy says, or the girl says, yes, you know, I'm going to work for a game company. And we're able, even able to sell the vision, yes, we start up, and yes, we're not PNG, we're not the great multinational company, uh, but you know, there's a risk, and equally there will be a reward, you will have a product soon, and we are all sold. But, the child goes home, mom and dad ask, gee, so, you know, brilliant education, what are you going to do next? I'm going to go join a games startup. <laughs> <laughs> joining a startup is bad enough, a games so, startup. Yeah, it's, uh, joining a startup is, it's not really the norm here, right? Yeah. The movie tech startup, and, and I think the economy is in the crunch, the security issues are there. I think that's been my biggest challenge, yeah. being able to sell the, so the job to the entire family actually. Okay, how? You know, this actually might be a good choice. Or maybe you can just try it out for six months. And maybe push one out the ticket, then you can go join the pieces. So how do you deal with it? Do you call the parents and talk to them or should, what should is we it? Put this on tape? <laughs> <laughs> I, we invite you them. threaten them. <laughs> you invite no, them out. No, uh, so I think it's it's only fair. Sorry, I don't go ahead. It's only fair ke, so Child alone is not a decision maker. If the mother and father are decision makers, so we sell the deal to them. Catch the thing. Here are our credentials. Here we have done. 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 Here we have and so, stuff like that, which is what uh, yeah, realistically what we really want. Each person joining us, this is why we thought about the you know, uh, hiring process. Each person joining us to definitely have a very good growth path. We right. want to be a lean, but very strong, technically strong team. Uh, 
तो हमारी तरफ से तो लिमिटेशन नहीं है ईच पर्सन ज्वाइनिंग हाउस पर डेफिनेटली हार्ड ऑफ वैल्यू इंटायर पाए शुड ग्रो अभी के लिए शायद वेरी अर्निस्टिक और आई एम वेरी अर्निस्टिक Right. So to start, you know, that your child is very passionate about. Uh, you know, let allow her or him a chance. To give this a shot. And does it normally work? <laughs> I think it has worked so far with everyone. It's very successful. You know, there are some, I think, other problems which sort of uh, come into play here as well, and some of those are industry specific. I think. Okay. You know, for example, if you are a fresh uh, graduate. Uh, and you're joining the IT industry as an, as an engineer. Your starting salary is appreciably less than what you would get if you were joining a different sector, right. like say banking, for example. Now there might be fewer jobs. There might be a glass ceiling in that sector. There might be not as much interest. You know, the work may not be as interesting. There are lots of other factors, but certainly it is very attractive when you haven't earned any money before in your life and you're looking for your first job. It is certainly very attractive to go to the high-paying job first. And parents also, you know, have that. And also joining a bank is joining like a bank, is a bank, lifetime yeah. career. Yes, yeah. that perception is very much there. You see, a very proper company to join. Yeah. So that's something that you know I think uh, companies in the sector generally have to compete with. So we have to compete on that as well, which is just to convince people that there is there is a growth path here. It may take a little bit longer, but there here you have a, you know in our mind at least a more meaningful growth path. You can actually go all the way to the top. You can do your own thing once right. you have the skills and knowledge. Right. Right. I mean, you know, you go abroad, you can do the same thing over there. I mean, there's a lot of there are a lot of doors that open up if you're right. a banker here. I know, I, I don't want to put down banking, <laughs> but I mean, you know, it's not the same. It's, it's boring, same. though. It's not the same. If you have some experience here and you go abroad, it's not the same. It's a different sector, and you know, there's a different growth path in that. So that's one big challenge, you know, usually. Um, and I think the second one is that you know. We cannot make any bold claims as to where we ourselves will be. You know, in all honesty, we have to be very clear about that with everyone we speak with. That as a startup, we you know have our situation changes. And that's true for any startup in the world. Uh, but with the risks come the rewards. Right. <laughs> so unless you take the risks, you can't get the rewards. And at this stage in any one's life, whether a fresh grad or a young person. This is the only stage in their life when they can take big risks. Exactly. Once they get older, they really can't. So this is the best time for them to do it. So you know that's the kind. Of, those are the kind of things we have to discuss. But usually, I think we come on the winning side. So it's it's been good so far. Now, what can we do? I mean, this is a flourishing field, uh, and we have very few companies, as we discussed in this space. What can we do to bring more companies into? Is it? Is it again a chicken and egg situation? Is it not enough people starting companies in this space? Is it not enough uh, human resource being available for uh, startups in the game area? What is it that is keeping us from uh, getting into what is, after all, a lucrative business? Um, I think you know a lot of the things you mentioned. They certainly are important. You know, the lack of human capital that is trained and can come in and deliver right away. Um, Probably startup funds, you know, some initials. It takes some initial cost to actually just get up and running. Uh, I, I think often you can get some seed investment from friends, families to get going. Um, having a mentality that we're not going to do you know, the run-of-the-mill stuff, which is there will be a service industry, service, you know, oriented company will do project projects for other companies and have sort of a uh, mentality where we can make some. Yield on top of every employee who works on a project. Um, getting out of that sort of very risk-free uh, environment into a more risk, uh, you know, open risk environment such as a product business. That that is one. I think he he should that we need more people who are bold and have can take on risk. I think some of that comes in from just helping young people recognize that there are opportunities the opportunities should be grasped and taken but i think there's a responsibility that faculty and certainly people like us also have 
on making young people aware of this, that you know, one should see these opportunities and look out for them. And um, probably I think funding is a big issue. I think for a lot of people, I mean some people with a little, a few resources can do the what I mentioned. Uh, but you know, there are a lot of very smart people who just aren't able to get started um, because they don't have funding for, for their work. We're not talking about that much money. So no. we're not really talking about millions of dollars, hundreds of thousands or anything like that. Probably about actually the same amount of money you would need for any small business in Pakistan. Okay, now supposing we have a company, they've developed a product, what next? I mean, how do they market it? That's a big issue so, as actually, well. Um, is it? You should go ahead. Yeah. You are yeah. a small CMO. Uh, CMO, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Speak up, if Mr. CMO. If you develop a product and then you're thinking about marketing, something has really gone wrong. Okay. Uh, before you even, you know, while you're thinking about the product, the marketing should start. And marketing is, if you mean promotion of a product, that's different. Right. But marketing in the product and research can now spend right. you know, so Knowing that a market exists or, actually out uh, there. Yeah. So there's actually this Calvin and Hobbes comic strip. Just me, Calvin is, you know how children sell lemonade? And so Calvin is selling uh, cake in the butt, or tails. And Hobbes next pay is is the cake. Now, how's business? And the next window of Calvin says, you know, I don't know why I'm not you know, selling like hot cakes because everybody needs one. Yet nobody is buying it. This is actually, I teach entrepreneurship and this is one story that I tell. You need to know the actual product. This is why I'm so excited. 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 Do they also think similarly about the product? So you are not the user. You are not the buyer. So you need to step out of the building. Uh, if you go out, you need to talk to people. Abhishek Bebar can also concept explain. You know, this is a good thing. They can get a lot of work. You can eat it. In a screen of vitamin in our own way. Uh, that's that's where the two it would start. But what if someone steals the idea? This is what many young people if, ask. Honestly, if your idea is so simple to execute, well the execution is the big chunk. Yeah. Right. Uh if your idea is the less simple, then might as well not do it. <laughs> you don't want to do it because the minute you're done with it, maybe somebody has done it before you finish executing it. Even, see, at some point you're going to go to the market, right? right so right. if your only barrier to entry is the idea you want to see, then you fail. I mean, you can't compete on that. Right. You have to have something more to compete on. Joe uh, Marzi has secret sauce. Secret sauce can be there. That's my opinion. Uh, yeah, I mean, there is certainly um, being the first and having the first mover advantage is essentially about having enough time to catch a lead that allows you to maintain that lead in the long run. Yeah, exactly. Right. So, you know, your idea should take at least a couple of months to do. <laughs> you know, preferably about six months to a year. And within that period of time, you know, you can certainly, I think, uh, develop different concepts. You can get fairly far and be secretive about it. So if you if you if you feel the idea is that uh, mm -hmm. that valuable and you don't want anyone to think about it or steal it. Now, one of the benefits of being in Pakistan is, I think, that the chances that good ideas will be stolen by other people. By at least smaller and fewer than they would be in a sort of environment like Silicon Valley um, or even in India, I, I would say, because here, a good idea. <laughs> that idea, sure, everyone will copy it. But, you know, a good idea, it, because there's a real amount of engineering, innovation, you know, a lot of things that have to be done, a lot of hard work has to be put in. And this is all done in the, with the belief that you will get there yeah. and will succeed. There's a lot of fight, so, lots of soup, lots of slush, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> lots of knives, all that goes in. Yeah, it's not all yeah. fun and games. No, it's it's, 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 it's hard work. Going without electricity. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, in, in Silicon Valley, I can see that, you know, they have very sharp people, very hard, you know, very experienced people sitting around, and there's a lot of sort of uh, cross fertilization almost, people leave one company, go somewhere else, you can have old teams leave and go and join a new company or you know, start something new. And there I think there's actually a higher risk of these type of things happening. Um, but there, you know, there's litigation, there's legal frameworks, they allow them to sort of safeguard themselves. Um, and um, I don't think we really have that problem. Here it's just a problem of execution. Right. You know. Okay. What else is on our agenda? Our agenda is actually done. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, Jehan, you want me to show you? No. <laughs> no. I, I will do that. Saturday. Saturday. <laughs> Thanks very much. Is there anything you else you much. wanted to say that we haven't covered? Um, um, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs>
It's actually very nice to meet you. No, no. Great talking to you guys. Thank you. Bye. I'm sorry about the moving camera, but I was just so excited about what these people were telling us that I just couldn't keep myself from moving the camera up and down and nodding. So I think next time I'll have to take Rabia along so that she can put it on a tripod and keep this steady. This is the kind of exciting stuff that's happening in Pakistan, innovation that's taking place here. And it's just growing and happening in almost every city in this country. I'm so excited about it, and I hope you are too. Join me again next time for another episode of In the Line of Wire.